Well, good day, everyone, everywhere, and special greetings to all those seated in heavenly places. And Jesus, our Messiah, in the name of this broadcast, is across the border. And this is our live Prophecy Reality Edition. So if you're listening live, come on over to the chat room if you're able to uh, uh, join us. I uh, really appreciate that. Otherwise, just keep listening right where you're at. Um, usually we go through the Bible uh, on this broadcast across the border five days a week and uh, go through the Bible one book at a time, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Sometimes we take an aside uh, to go through other works, uh, but every Wednesday we lay all that down and we take a look at prophecy. Now, I really don't have a whole lot of prophecy in the news unless you consider uh, Trump's UN speech anything special. Um, I didn't really get to watch it, so I really can't say anything about it that much, but I'm pretty sure that it's not very, there's not very much new there um, that we didn't know the week before. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, there's a lot of talk about World War Three. Yeah, a lot of people talking about the uh, beating the war drums. Some people have been beating the war drums for 20 years, like uh, our good friend Rick Wiles over there at True News, uh, continually beating the war drums. Eventually, we're going to get World War III, and he's going to be right. So, um, I don't know if World War III is going to start next week or if it has anything to do with uh, Kim Jong-il over there in North Korea. <clears throat> I'm sure that... Uh, when those the when the Antichrist, uh, who does rule the world right now, has prophesied in the Scripture itself that he would rule the world and he would rule the money powers in the end time, uh, leading up to the return of Christ. Uh, so we should be able to look around and acknowledge that that is happening, that is going on. Uh, so nothing new there. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're a futurist, then you don't know who the Antichrist is because you have blinders on and you can't see what's plainly in front of your face. You don't recognize the mark of the beast. You don't recognize Satan's monetary system being a uh, fiat or an unjust weight and balance uh, a fiat currency uh, that is created by usury out of thin air. You don't recognize that because... You don't believe in the Antichrist. You believe that the Antichrist is, is nobody can know who he is right now. That's one of their favorites. Like, oh, nobody can know who the Antichrist is. That's one of their favorite mantras. They repeat over and over. You can't know. He might be in the world right now, but we don't know who he is. <laughs> okay, well, keep your blinders on. You know, cling to your uh, futurist escape route. Uh, that's all a fiction, of course, made up by the Antichrist and his Jesuit counter-reformation army. So you're falling right in line with the Antichrist. And when he pulls off his little stunt play here um, in the near future, you'll, you'll roll right along with it. And in the end, you will worship the Antichrist simply because you don't want to recognize him. You want it to be a fantasy that the Antichrist himself has fed you in order to get you to worship him. You know, believe it? Well, read my latest book. And my latest book is called um, When the Rapture... Uh, when the Rapture... When the Third Temple is Built, the Rapture Play Will Begin. Um, and I, read, I wrote this book for futurists because I wanted to catch him with one with the title. And I wanted to, to take a good look at it. It's just a short, about 100 pages. And uh, it'll give you a, why, a good objection to um, the whole future scheme of things that you're waiting for with bated breath. Well, basically all you're waiting for is the imminent return of Christ at which we will be raptured. Well, you know, only if you believe in a rapture is the return of Christ imminent. Did you know that? Only futurists believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Now, the historicist, we would, preterists, we won't even go there, okay? Uh, now, the historicists, those that hold the historical interpretation of prophecy from the scripture and 
from the history of the church, the historical, historicist position, um, well, they know that the return of Christ isn't imminent because if you open up the book of Revelation, you'll read that there are things that have not happened yet that are supposed to happen before it returns. Therefore, the return of Christ is not imminent until those last things have happened. Now, of course, if you're a futurist and you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, well, the return of Christ is imminent because all of the bad things, as a matter of fact, all of the calamity of the entire book of Revelation is going to happen after your secret rapture. That's right. Your secret rapture, which is not in the Bible, and that's because it's a secret. It wasn't revealed till about 1830, okay? And the reason it wasn't revealed till about 1830 because it's not in God's Word. And God has only revealed to us what is in His Word. And if He's revealed anything else to you, uh, before you can count on it, you better find it in God's Word, not by conjecture. You should find at least one or two, see, and let everything be established by two or more witnesses. So it should be one or two uh, explicit or express texts in the scripture itself to uh to give a witness to your belief but your pre-tribulation rapture even the pre even the seven-year tribulation isn't even in the bible there's no wit zero witnesses at all now by conjecture you could say well this sounds like it you know here's a good conjecture for you uh, noah and his family went into the ark and God shut the door, and they weren't left behind. See, they escaped before all the calamity of the flood came upon the earth and all of the unbelievers, right? So they say that's that's a picture of the rapture. Well, that's that's called conjecture. It doesn't explicitly say when Jesus returns for a secret rapture, it'll be like the time that God shut the door on the on the ark or whatever. You can't find that explicitly in the scripture. So by conjecture, you can make the scripture say anything you want. You can support any supposition you want. But without one, at least one or two clear, explicit, and expressed in the text of the scripture itself, um, uh, statements supporting your supposition, you, you shouldn't hold on to it. You should let go of it. You go, well, you know, maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but I have no way of knowing because God's Word doesn't support that. Okay, so get my book, When the Third Temple is Built, the Rapture Play Will Begin. Now, we got one hour that we're just going to talk about whatever's in the news, and I don't have a whole lot of news uh, to report on. Maybe you have some news items um, that have to do with prophecy, and you could uh, give me a call or or uh, put links to them in the chat room, and I'll even check the chat room right now. Uh, uh, good morning, Naughty Pines, uh, Blue Raven, WW, and Wacky Artists. Hmm, wacky Artists is in the chat room. Um, let's see. Okay. Thank you for the blessings there, Blue Raven, in the chat room. Um, Trump had a speech. I missed it, says WW. Um, but nothing. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, well, no questions or comments in the chat room, but the number's there if you want to call in. Uh, I sent out over 500 notifications. These are people that subscribe to my blog. Uh, uh, five or six hundred people got a notification that we were having a live show. I guess they, I guess these people like to read but not show up for a live broadcast. Okay, so uh, maybe they'll listen later when I when I post the show. Most of them will listen to it. Okay, well let's see what else do we got. No, World War Three. Um, hmm. Well, World War Three. Let's talk about World War Three. I'm not sure. You know, I've been uh, going through some series on 
I think there's one in Netflix and another one out there uh, outlining uh, World War III. They got a new one, World War III in color, where they colorized all the film because all the film was black and white back then, or most of it was anyway. And uh, boy, that was that was a horrendous worldwide war. And to think of something like that again, and then there are people like, a lot of people say, well, this time America won't escape. Well, yeah, they're, what are they, they're going to guess they're going to have to drop nukes on us so that we won't escape. So, I mean, what do you do? You know, do you flee America? It's like, if it's a world war, where are you going to go? That it's not going to, you know, there's not going to be any. I mean, they call it a world war before there was, there, the, as close as it came to America was Hawaii. Uh, didn't really touch South America, so not really a worldwide war. Maybe it was Hemisphere uh, War One and Hemisphere War. It probably, you know, I believe that. I mean, they had a Thirty Years War once. Wasn't that really World War One? If we're just talking about, you know, um, the old world hemisphere. Hmm. Okay. Now you rejects court call to implement western wall okay well i don't know what that means you get see you have to call in ww and tell me what this means because <laughs> uh either that or i need these before the show so i could research them but uh, today i was just so busy right up to the moment of the show dealing with everything else that i really didn't have time to do any preparation work so we're just going to kind of wander around here the first hour and let's, uh, and hopefully we'll get some calls and somebody will have something intelligent to, to say. Otherwise, you know, I gotta, I gotta say, jump into my, one of my books here and, and, and talk more about it. And I should probably talk more about it since I'm not getting any interviews. Nobody wants to touch this book with a 10 foot pole. Nobody will have me on to interview me about when the third temple is built. What is, why not? I, I don't get it. Is, is historicism, is it so offensive, no matter how I try to package it, that nobody wants to know about it? Or is it just too anti-Catholic? I guess that would be the word, anti-Catholic. It's a hate speech. Because um, true Protestantism, and true historicism, it would be hate speech to the to the Catholics, where we're called Catholic bashers. Well, of course, you know we're saying what the Protestant fathers and the pre-Reformation fathers said about the Catholic Church being the great apostasy and the Pope sitting in the seat of the Antichrist to this very day. And so, I guess they can call us haters and and bashers, but. You know, I mean, God hates, doesn't he? Is it God a hater? Uh, didn't he say, Jacob I have loved, but uh, Esau I have hated? You know, and read the story of Jacob and Esau, everything that the scripture has to say about Jacob and Esau. And you should be able to understand why God would make that statement. You know, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. Now, I, Jacob's been... Um, been berated as a scoundrel, and you know maybe maybe he was. I don't know. You know, um, he did make a hard bargain with his brother at, at an opportune moment to obtain that birthright, and then his brother, when when the time came to give it up, his brother was not going to give it up. I mean, he was going after that birthright. He was going to get that blessing that came with it from his father Isaac. Okay. So who's really the bad guy here? The guy who doesn't keep his word and doesn't keep his covenant? Uh, Esau? Or Jacob, who, with his mother and following his mother's instructions, uh, deceived the father into, uh, into giving him the blessing because his father was going to give the blessing to Esau. And you know, what, what kind of a dysfunctional family we got going on here, man? We, we think we're dysfunctional today. Well, I mean, there's, a, there's some dysfunction here. Um, Isaac was a man of God in the lineage of uh, the Messiah, Jesus, the Messiah. And, and um, yet he favors, 
the unfavored son, the son that God hates. You go, what's going on there? Is it just because he loved the way he cooked? You know, <laughs> I don't know. Then you, you look at the character traits of these two boys, you know, or two men, uh, of course, growing up as boys. And, and you go, well, you know, I've, I've known a number of Esau's, really nice guys. Uh, you know, uh, Esau always brought the meat to the barbecue, you know, because uh, he was the hunter. And uh, I guess maybe his dad really liked that. I mean, I like, so he wants to bring barbecue. You want to bring some good tri-tip or, you know, uh, a good uh, good slice of beef over to my house to barbecue. We'll, you know, we'll cook it up, Ed. You know, you'll be welcome. Well, that's the kind of guy Esau was. That's the way I picture him anyway. But uh, he was not a righteous man. Yeah, unfortunately, he wasn't a righteous man. He was a heck of a nice guy, but um, God says, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. So we got to take a look at when God says something like that. I think we need to pay special attention. And when it comes time, you know, to separate the goats from the sheep or the Jacobs from the Esau's, you know, I want to be on the side where Jacob is, you know, the one that God loves. How about you? <laughs> uh, you know, what a dumb question. Of course, everybody wants to be on the side that God loves, unless, of course, you hate God, but then you're not listening to this broadcast to begin with. Okay, so how did I get there? Hmm. Jacob, I have loved that. That, that's, that story and those uh, uh, scriptures really affected my life, especially that story I decided that I want to be a Jacob and not an Esau. So, okay. Anyway, everyone needs to get this book, and I know some of you have helped help me in um, getting this book out there. I've given more copies away, and actual physical copies. Uh, probably about broke even on how many I've sold and I, how many I've given away, physical copies. E-copies I've given... I know, hundreds or, you know, thousands of copies of this book away, um, yet don't seem to have very much traction in the world out there. Now, if I wrote something left behind that was really, really, uh, you know, um, uh, something about futurism, well, the Antichrist would be there with the backing for it to make sure it got out there. Because that's what the Antichrist is. You take a look at all of these, uh, these famous prophecy books today, like the Harbinger, and think just, or how about John Hagee and his Blood Moons Mania of 2014? You know, so they aren't they aren't saying so much about the Blood Moons anymore, are they? You know, it's all, what they came and they went, and and I read some of those books. Well, uh, the Harbinger and the Blood Moon. You know, I've looked at those, and they're just all a lot of nonsense. It's like a I think it was a harbinger and all these things, the, the dates and stuff that he came up with. Or was it the the blood moons? Both of those. And, you know, and you, you look into them and you go, they're kind of, well, it's kind of iffy. It looks like they're trying to shoehorn things to hold up their thesis. But, you know, you know, it's like close, but no cigar. You know, and hand grenades and horse shoes... Close is good enough. But when you're talking about God's word and prophecy, like I said, let's get back to the, to the two witnesses in scripture. Let everything be established by two or more witnesses. Do you not think that God himself would hold his own uh, prophetic utterance or revelation to his own standard? Of course he would. That's why there are two witnesses in the book of Revelation, you know, because two is the minimum required. So anything in prophecy, but you cannot find, like I said, you cannot find two witnesses for a gap between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel. As a matter of fact, you can't even find one witness. And the whole futurist seven year tribulation deception pre-tribulation deception rapture scenario 
there are no, no witnesses whatsoever. Like I said, only conjecture and conjecture is not a witness. But you know, if conjecture is all you got, that's why they run with it because conjecture is all they have. So I pull out a, a, you know, a, a video and I say like, show me the gap, Chuck. You know, what do I hear? Crickets, <laughs> you know, the dead silence of the night, nothing at all. Yet they go on and on and on pushing their phony scenario trying to get people, they just want, you know, and I believe a lot of them are genuine. They just, they want to believe it so bad because they're so afraid. They are fearful. And I was looking at a scripture here. Speaking of fear, I think that was second Timothy chapter two. Let's see if this thing actually goes backwards. Yes, there it is. Uh huh. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Paul continues, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Well, See, this is what's the fear about? It's a, it's a fear about being a partaker in the afflictions of God. And that's what this whole escapist futurist mentality is all about. They want to escape the affliction. So they made up, okay, well, let's go back to the Jesuit Ribera who said, oh, well, the Pope's not the Antichrist 500 years ago. You know, you got, you got Martin Luther and all the Protestant fathers and the pre-Reformation fathers who recognize the papacy as the seat of Antichrist and, and the Roman Catholic Church as the great apostasy. You, you got them on one hand going, no, it's not the Pope. It can't be the Pope because, <laughs> because, you know, he's our great papa. He's the head of the church on earth. And then you got, you got the Reformation fathers going, oh man, it's the Pope, dude. You know, uh, we recognize it by reading the scripture for ourselves. And not only that, we found, we found Christ by grace alone, by faith alone, sola scriptura. But you come along and, and you're saying something different and you're putting up a man in the place of God, the, the vicar of Christ. The very word antichrist means in place of Christ. That's what Antichrist means. And if there's anyone on earth that's, that's sitting in place of Christ uh, and proclaiming it, well, that would be the vicar or the pope. That they, so you got one hand saying it is, and you got a, another hand saying it is, and then Ribera comes along and he writes his, his treatise on the end time Antichrist. Okay, we're going into a break. We'll be back in a few minutes. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to Cross the Border, our Prophecy Reality Edition. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. 
Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Welcome back. You're listening to Cross Border. This is our Prophecy Reality Edition. And uh, we were talking about the Jesuit <coughs> Ribera, how we introduced uh, the end time Antichrist scenario. It's called the Counter Reformation scenario because you had all the Pre Reformation fathers and the Reformation fathers screaming loudly loudly proclaiming and protesting uh, the papacy as the seat of the Antichrist and loudly protesting the uh, unbiblical uh, Antichrist doctrines coming out of the the uh, worldwide uh, Catholic, Roman Catholic Church on the earth at the time. And there's no doubt in their minds who the Antichrist was. But the Counter-Reformation... Uh, Jesuit Ribera wrote his treatise on the end time Antichrist and it has since then been built upon into what we have today where most of the so-called Protestants, now they don't even call themselves Protestants anymore, they call themselves evangelicals and they have bought it hook, line and sinker and it's because they're fearful and they have a lot to be afraid of because one the end time antichrist scenario of the futurists, um, they have taken all of the calamity of the entire book of Revelation and they said that this is all going to happen in a three and a half or a seven year period immediately, immediately preceding the return of Christ, thus the end time antichrist scenario. And so we, you need an escape from that, see? And God has provided you an escape. That's what they're trying to tell you. Okay. But God hasn't called us to an escape. And one, it's a lie because all of the calamity of the entire book of Revelation uh, is not going to be crammed into the last three and a half or seven years immediately before re Christ returns when the Antichrist, when their end time Antichrist showed up. See, it says most of that calamity has already passed, has, uh, has already happened in the past. And if you get a book like um, The Last Prophecy, E.B. Eliot's Hori Apocalyptica Abridgment, which you can get this one here, I think it's ten ninety nine for this pocketbook edition here. Um, go to my Get the Book page and scroll down, and you'll see a link there to uh, low cost prof, uh, low cost uh, pocketbook editions. So get The Last Prophecy, Hori Apocalyptica twenty fifteen, and uh, that's the abridgment of his great work. So if you can read that, then maybe you can move on to the great, the big, the big uh, twenty-five hundred page one. But or get Key to the Apocalypse by H. Grattan Guineas, where he ties uh, together uh, the seven 
It's called The Seven Divine Interpretations of Symbolic Prophecy for Understanding the Apocalypse. And he takes you through and shows you how the seven key prophecies that tie it all together and gives you a better understanding of prophecies. Make sure you get a copy of that, Key to the Apocalypse. Look at the cover. This is our publication when you'll see the woman who riding the beast on the red cover. That's the one you want. And right now, second hour, we're going through uh, history, unveiling prophecy. Not available in a pocketbook edition yet, though, but you can buy this full-size version at my website by clicking on the same link there and um, because I haven't finished reviewing it yet. I've been, like I said, very busy. But we're going through this second hour, so you're going to want to stick around for the second hour as we continue this. I believe we're doing uh, part 18 in the second hour today. Um, and you can back up and start with uh, part one, or better yet, get a copy of the book yourself and read it for yourself. And all of these are available free. So uh, if you go to my uh, free ebook tab there, you can get all of these, you know, um, free in a PDF or uh, what an EPUB version, whichever is available. So uh, we don't want to withhold any information, any of this important information from anyone. And uh, on that vein, uh, on that note, uh, you can support us. Go to my website, crosstheborder.org, and specifically support this work by uh, clicking on the le button in the left-hand cor corner where it says Support Cross the Border. Uh, if you want to support FirstAmendmentRadio.com, you go there and you can support there. If you want to send checks or money orders, uh, you can send them uh, by going to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Because if you send me a check, I likely won't be able to cash it because I might be a terrorist and you might be funding terrorist activities according to to the Patriot Act and the banking rules that have been implemented, which are really only there for one purpose, and that is for the ultimate implementation of the mark of the beast. That's all this drug wars and all this stuff is all leading to, um, because Satan has been ruling, the Antichrist has been ruling the money power <clears throat> uh, since, uh, well, 1913, and the Federal Reserve coup of the U.S. Treasury. Uh, and I write a little bit about that in my book. Um, what's the name of that book? The Rapture Will Be Canceled. There's a, there's a chapter, you know, there's several chapters in there that, that uh, speak uh, on that issue about Satan's ruling the money and the mark of the beast. There's a chapter on the mark of the beast in there if you're interested in that. A lot of articles on my website. To uh, most of the what's in my book is on my website somewhere, so make sure you take advantage of all those resources there. Okay, and we were looking at uh, I've, I've wrote it down during the break here. the The title for this episode is called "Fearful Futurists," because that's why people cling to futurism because they are fearful. They're fearful of all of the calamity. And it's a lie, so tell people a big lie to really scare the, the whatever out of them, to scare the hell out of them, I guess. And, uh, well, to scare the hell in them because it's a lie. But, uh, and so they buy into your escape plan, which is false prophecy, is your escape plan. <laughs> How do you like that, futurist? Your escape plan is false prophecy because it's not going to be happen. You're not going to be raptured out before the Antichrist is revealed. What's the whole point? So it's really kind of silly uh, that when you think about what they believe. Silly futurists. They believe that the Antichrist is going to come to tempt the whole world, but the Antichrist doesn't need to tempt the whole world. He needs to tempt Christians, right? Because he already owns the whole world. He's not after them. He's after you. Satan's after you, not the world. He already has the world in his hand. He, he wants you. So what? Uh, that uh, I'm without words. Okay. So anyway, this scenario has all of the Christians, all the true believers, are raptured away. Then the Antichrist shows up, 
and implements his mark of the beast for all the people that he already owns, lock, stock, and barrel. Now, how does that make any sense whatsoever? He's kind of come lately, isn't he? Is it kind of too late? Uh huh. And then that actually they believe that the resurrection is not for Christians, but it's for people who died before the rapture and those who come to Christ after the rapture. Because they wouldn't come to Christ before the rapture when the Holy Spirit and Christianity was on earth. They waited till Satan had full sway and the, and the, uh, and the Holy Ghost was removed from the earth. Then finally they got the guts all on their own without any help from the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's taken off the earth or the man of sin can't be revealed according to silly rapture theology, silly futurist theology or eschatology. Then they finally decided for Christ and decided to even die for him. <laughs> oh, it's not funny but because it's, it's really kind of stupid. You go, what? And then all of the calamity in the entire book of Revelation is going to ensue in three and a half. No, 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 no. Not so. Not going to happen. Like I said, history unveiling prophecy or history unfolding. Yeah, prophecy unfolding as history. So most of the calamity of the entire book of the Revelation has already taken place. There's a little calamity left. Don't worry about it. We've got calamity left before Christ comes. So don't, don't worry about, you know, uh, having escaped at all because most of it has happened in the past. And what that really means is that as a church, being there, there being no pre-tribulation rapture, that means we, as the true church, who are going to live until the resurrection, not a pre-tribulation rapture, which you can't find in the Bible, which there are no witnesses to in the Bible, nothing explicit expressed anywhere in the scripture, and that's what a witness is. It's, it's something explicit or expressed in the text. It's like you get you call a guy up to the witness stand and say, did you see John Doe standing over that guy with a knife? And he goes, well, you know, um, I saw him headed that way uh, the day before he was headed in that direction. That's kind of, so I think that was him. He, you know, he probably went there. See, that's called, that's called conjecture. I conjecture that he went there and murdered him. No, that's not a witness. That's called conjecture. Yeah, or you can call someone who saw it. So, yes, I, I saw him. I'm expressing. He was standing over the knife with the knife and pulling it, and he kept, you know, pounding it into him. And that's explicit, explicit, and that's express testimony and witness. And that's the only kind of witness that we want is express testimony and witness from the Scripture itself. We want witnesses to whatever your scenario is. Now. Historicism, we have, we have a witness. We have history as a witness. Prophecy fulfilled is a witness. We, we can start with all of the Old Testament prophecies and see how they were fulfilled. You know, there's kind of a rule of first fulfillment. That does it. You know, some people have made a mistake. Well, they said, well, this, the false prophet was this or the, the second beast was that, and they tried to place it in history, you know, before, but then it comes up later, like now, and we go, oh, yeah, you know, we, we know. We know who the second beast is now. It's evident that the second beast is, uh, is America. It's evident now that it's not a division of the Roman Empire because it rises up not out of the sea where the Roman Empire rose up. So, you know, some mistakes were made throughout, but they were always corrected by the historicists uh, contemporary to their time. 
said you have to uh, you have to study to show yourself approved. But anyway, so we have the fearful futurists, but Paul's word to them: Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor uh, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. You know, so it's not. See, this is Protestantism, not by works. We're, he's not called us according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to given us in Jesus Christ before the world began. See, we walk in the good works, which God before ordained, before the world began, before ordained that we might walk in them. So for the Protestant, works follow faith. For the apostate church, well, you do works and you might be saved. You have to do works to be saved. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, and Paul says, and an apostle and a teacher to the Gentiles. We have life and immortality by the gospel. We're not going to preach another message. I preach the gospel that Jesus preached. That's why I call my broadcast Cross the Border, as in cross the border into the kingdom of God and live forever. Jesus said it. He said, repent for the kingdom is at hand. See, the gospel is a kingdom gospel. The kingdom of God is where we walk and live and have our being in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We may look like everyone else on earth. You know, Jesus says um, that you can't tell by looking at someone uh, the whether the Spirit of God is in them or not. In so many words, I'm kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, paraphrasing a little bit there. But we walk, we live and move and have our being in Christ Jesus. As Paul said, we are seated in heavenly places. And that's why I open my broadcast with a special greeting to all those seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, because that is the gospel. The gospel is entering into his kingdom now. And Jesus gave us the key. The key to the kingdom is repentance. A naughty, naughty, bad word in the world. They don't like repentance, because repentance means change your mind about the things that you're doing. Change your mind about the things that are displeasing to God in your life. And if you change your mind, then the works will follow. The fruit will follow. He said you'll, you will know them by their fruit. So we walk in his kingdom. Now here's the problem with repentance, with changing your mind to the world. Why they hate the word repentance is simply because they do not want to change their mind. The homosexuals, they want to keep on homosexualizing. And um, the, the robbers and the thieves, they want to keep stealing from their neighbor. And the, the socialists want to uh, privily defraud their neighbor uh, without a cause to steal their goods, to fill their own houses with treasures, with spoil. So they want to rob their neighbor. They don't want to change their mind. They don't want to walk in true charity. They hate the kingdom of God. They simply do not want to change their mind. They want to continue in their idolatry, their fornication, and their adulteries. That's why they hate repentance. I love repentance. Why? Because it changes me. It makes me new. It keeps me walking in God's kingdom. And I am continually, you know, allowing 
God to wash me by the water of his word to the renewing of my mind. Changing your mind, renewing your mind. See, Paul preached the same gospel Jesus did in different words. But we're preaching the same gospel. He said, renew your mind by the washing of the water of the word. That's called changing your mind. That is the very essence of what it means to repent, to allow the Holy Spirit to work repentance in you. That's the first work of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, he wants to work that repentance in you. And we are matured by him. We are being perfected. There's another word that Paul talked about, continually being perfected. We are in a state of being perfected. Not that we are perfected or that we have become perfect, but we are being perfected continually. I I know because I, as much as I would like to be perfect so that it can please my Heavenly Father because I love Him. And why do I love Him? Because He loved me first. So Of course, I want to please him, which means I want to live by his word. I would like to be perfect, but I realize I can't be perfect, but I can be in a state of being perfected. Yes, I've come to that conclusion over 45 years now of walking with Christ is that uh, this being perfected is a process that continues as long as our mortality remains. And if you're not being perfected, then you are not walking in God's kingdom. And if you are being perfected, well, you know, year by year, it may not seem like a whole lot is happening, but if you can stand back like I can, you stand back, look back over the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 45 years, and you go, yes, God is working. Yeah, I am being perfected. I am better than I was 10 years ago. And I am better than I was 20 years ago and 30 years ago and 40 years ago and 45 years ago. I have much treasure stored up in heaven. I have so much that I could never turn back now. And that's the point we get to as mature Christians. If we mature in Christ, if we mature in our being perfected in Christ, then we don't, we aren't afraid. We aren't fearful of death because we realize we know that one, we're going to die anyway. I mean, I'm 45 years from where I started as a teenager, uh, when, when I was adopted, uh, and I accepted the adoption uh, to where I am now. I'm 45 years closer to the end of my mortality, whatever that means, and however long, far off that may be. And, and everyone dies. We know we're going to die. And so mortality is a given, you know. Our death, the death of our mortal f- flesh is a given. And what's more important is what lies beyond the grave now for me because I have so much uh, invested in the kingdom of God that that is where my treasure is. It's beyond the grave. It's beyond this mortality. It's when this mortal shall put on immortality. Okay. Let's see. No comments, questions. I've got everyone mesmerized, huh? in the chat room. Ah, oh, well, that's the end of the hour. Well, may the Almighty uh, bless you and keep you in his kingdom uh, as you continue to grow in him until he returns or we go to be with him, um, whichever may come first. I'm hoping to stick around another, well, almost 40 years till he comes. We'll see you next time on Cross the Border.
Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthebordered.org.